you so much. I just want to take a quick second to say that making independent films is really challenging, <laughs> super challenging. So thank you to everyone in the audience who was supportive to me personally throughout making the film. I was the series producer of National Geographic's Dogtown, so I was uh, for about two and a half years. So I was actually on the ground when the dogs were first rescued and came to Best Friends Animal Society. So I actually was there filming the footage of Cherry when he refused to walk. Um, and after the series, due to its natural close, I stayed in touch with um, people at Best Friends, who I'm very close with, um, and was aware that the dogs had sort of gone on to find adoptive homes, that, but that nobody had told their story. And I just felt like it was a powerful story that was inspirational that people could also relate to, because people always say that people can't change. But here was this dog, Cherry, who I later met at a Best Friends fundraising event called Strut Your Mutt. Um, a few years ago, and I just could not believe that this dog who I had originally met, who would flatten and refuse to walk, and who was so shut down for, for, for a few years, um, had gone on to live successfully and happily in an adoptive home, um, and had learned to trust. Um, it was just so inspirational and touching to me. You know, when we applied to adopt Cherry, we weren't really looking to apply to adopt somebody that was going to be in a film. Um, we, were really <laughs> we were really looking for a family dog, and when we did see him, we had another pit bull at the time named Madison, um, who was very confident, kind of like Meryl was in the, the film. Um, we kind of call her Mama to Cherry, because Cherry really needed somebody to help guide him, um, and that's what she did. Um, but as far as bringing him into our lives, it's just, I don't know, it just... Um, he became such a part of the family so quickly um, that it, it, what you saw on the screen is exactly how we, we live our lives. And um, coming from the background that he had and all the work, not only you know at Best Friends, but at the USDA, Rebecca Huss, um, all the wonderful donors out there that have given Cherry a chance. Well, we actually just screened last weekend in, in Denver and in St. Louis. And we're hoping also to screen in Florida. Um, so Denver still has a very extreme ban against pit bulls. Um, Little Red's um, mother, Susan, lives nearby in Wyoming. And we would have liked to have Little Red come to the screening in Denver. But it really wasn't worth the risk because authorities can literally just take your dog from you and euthanize it. Kill it. Actually, I think euthanasia is supposed to be a kind thing to do, um, so I don't like to use the word euthanasia. I mean, I, there, people do terrible things to dogs all over the country. I mean, for me, it's really not about the dog at all. Um, it's about the people who are doing terrible things to dogs. And actually, it's not in the film, but many dogs refuse to fight. In the USDA report, there are multiple eyewitness, eyewitness witness accounts about how Michael Vick and his um, colleagues, if you want to call them that, um, would kill dogs who were underperforming. Most dogs flat out will refuse to fight and consequently are killed by dog fighters. So um, most dogs want to, as Tim Racer says in the film, they just want to play frisbee, they just want to be loved, they want to take a walk, they want to go swimming. So I, I don't think that banning pit bulls anywhere really solves any, any problems at all. And, and really, the ban of pit bulls um, is just like any other regulatory law where law-abiding citizens will follow that. Um, but the people who are going to break the laws, it doesn't really help there. Um, so I think banning pit bulls within a city, um, obviously it doesn't work. Um, one of the things it does cause, um, you have to enforce that. That's tax dollars, um, money wasted going down the drain. Um, that could be used somewhere else, a beneficial. Uh, we tried to use more um, overarching dog laws that aren't specific towards a breed, but just dogs in general, to make the community safer. Just by banning one breed of dog doesn't make any community safer. I mean, I think that cruelty against animals across the board should have stiffer penalties and much more, and, and that's happening. This, this case, actually, when it happened, was not a felony. Um, so Michael Vick served 23 months in jail. Not a day of it for animal cruelty, actually. It was for conspiracy. Um, which most people aren't aware of. Um, but now, as a result of this case, it's a felony, and people are getting sentences of up to five years for dog fighting. Um, there was a case um, that we had tried to follow in New Lano, Louisiana, of a family who had uh, unwittingly moved to New Lano only to find that pit bulls were actually banned there. And they didn't really have the resources to move away. 
Um, so they had to keep their pit bull um, an hour away in a shelter for something like eight months while they battled the town of Milano with the help of, of, a, of a lawyer. They ultimately won the case, but I mean, you don't really want to live in a town where you feel like your dog is not welcome, so it doesn't really help. Um, but I mean, yes, t t as Paul suggested, it's very expensive to enact these laws against pit bulls, um, and some people do challenge them. Um, which is even more tax dollar, uh, tax dollars are going down the drain when there are so many more productive ways to spend uh, community money, tax money. And what we've seen in the uh, recently are states mm -hmm. enacting laws that prohibit breed-specific legislation. Um, one of the problems that we're running into is grandfathered laws. That's why Denver hasn't been overturned. It's been grandfathered into Colorado law. <clears throat> But as we are moving forward, I think the last five, six years, we're overcoming those. And I think it really is a matter of time before we see all the laws um, erased from the books. Um, I did try to reach out to Michael Vick for an interview because it was important to me to try to give him a voice. Although he has been interviewed at length about this, and if you watch the, the clips of him, his story doesn't really change much. So I don't think there would, would have been anything new that would have contributed to the film. But yes, we did try to reach out to him. Five years ago when Oprah was winding down, he was due to be on one of her last shows. Um, we thought it was important that the dogs had a voice in the show, just to show they were showing his redemption. So we figured it was a good chance to show what the dogs have been able to do. Um, and Oprah's producers actually thought that was a wonderful idea. Um, Michael Vick then canceled the next day, so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, we've been hard at work on finishing the film, um, and this um, we only premiered about a month ago. So um, we are definitely hard at work on distribution, um, and hopefully we'll have good news soon. Um, the hope is that this will be widely available in 2016, um, and that we will probably do some uh, semi-theatrical screenings around the country, um, and then the film hopefully will be available uh, for download online. Maybe we can even push for like a dog-friendly cinemas, look at this <laughs> thing. I had a lot of experience working on Dogtown for two and a half years telling stories about dogs. Um, but you, with Handsome Dan in the film, when is terrified of cameras, terrified. Terrified of new people. So when we first arrived in Rhode Island, our DP um, had to stay upstairs in the room with him for about an hour, um, just getting him used to, by, by himself. I just left him up there by himself with the camera. Um, so that uh, Hanson Van would sort of get used, used to us being there. And we just took things really slowly when we first arrived. Um, and you also, you can't direct dogs. <laughs> we really don't talk about Michael Vick much. It's really about the dogs and the animals. Um, but one of the things that I think sticks in my side a little bit about the situation is people give him credit for shedding light on the plight of the pit bull. Um, and as you can see in the movie, he painted his sheds black he blacked out the windows. He was not trying to shed light on anything. Um, and if it wasn't for the hard work of the USDA, Rebecca Huss, Bad Rap, uh, Best Friends, and all the other rescue organization, realistically, these dogs would have just became statistics. They would have been euthanized. And we probably wouldn't be talking about Michael Vick today and any of the dog fighting. So um, to give credit to somebody for committing a crime, um, just it just doesn't sit well for me, especially when they're trying to cover it up. Um, so, you know, please go out, support best friends, bad rap, your local shelters. Um, they're the ones that are making changes in the world. And that's, you know, it goes back to what I was talking about before of, you know, my wife and I and our family really feel a deep responsibility um, since these dogs did get that chance to help other dogs and other animals like them. Um, because really when it comes down to it, it's not that they were a fighting dog, it's that they were a dog that was traumatized in a situation. They're just like a dog coming out of a puppy mill or another abusive situation. Just the fact that they were fight dogs doesn't make them any different. Well, you made a wonderful film and well, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.